Hello, welcome to Online Sunday School. Today we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan as we continue discussing the parables of Jesus. But before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. We give thanks and praise to you. Thank you for getting us through another week. Thank you for comforting us when we needed comfort and being strength for us when we needed strength. Father, open our ears so that we may hear your word in a new way, that we may hear what you would want us to hear. Open our hearts so that we may understand and open our eyes so that we can see those around us as our neighbors. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So we've been looking at the parables of Jesus. And the Good Samaritan is one that everybody has heard. And everybody, even people that don't know Christ, have heard of the Good Samaritan. But I wanted to take a look at it again, maybe with a little different perspective, maybe with a little fresh eyes, because there's always something to be learned from God's Word. It's so rich in context that we can always pick up something that we haven't considered before. But before we get started with reading the parable I want to talk a little bit about some background things. Now, we all know that the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. The Jewish people considered the Samaritans their enemy. They also considered them less than even Gentiles. It was it was said that a a Jewish person would not stop to help a Gentile woman in labor because that would bring another Gentile into the world. And the Jewish people hated the Samaritans even more than Gentiles. They were considered unclean, half-breed, the list goes on. Even the disciples... Uh, when a Samaritan village rejected Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus, do you want us to call fire to rain down on them? I mean, this was a deep hatred of Samaritans. They were the lowest level. And interestingly enough, where the, this parable is in the New Testament, Jesus has just gone up on the mountain, the transfiguration has happened. Some of the disciples saw him in all his glory. And then right after that, they're arguing over who is the, the best one, who is on top, who's the best disciple, the greatest one. It's quite a contrast. So let's look into Luke 10 and get started with the story. We pick up at verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And I'm going to stop there. Now, this lawyer or man, scholar of the law, he's asking, how do I inherit eternal life? 
Now, the Greek word in the New Testament used for tested isn't in a mean or evil way. It's more of an inquiry. So, some scholars believe that this man was challenging Jesus, but some believe that he was earnestly asking about eternal life. We have to keep in mind that eternal life does not just mean the length of your life, nor does it mean the living after death. It is more of living within the kingdom. It, we all, after our death, there's heaven and there's hell. But living an eternal life means that we're living with God, that we're with God, that we're living the life he wants, both now on earth as well as after our death. This is what the man is asking about. Now, Jesus kind of turns him back to the, the commandments. He points back to the commandments when he says uh, what is written in the law. There's a little note of sarcasm, perhaps in response to being tested. Now, the lawyer knows the essence of, of the scripture. He knows what the law means. He says to love God with everything you have and to love your neighbor. But knowing and doing are not the same. And Jesus says, do this and you will live. So then the man asked, who's my neighbor? Now, why does he ask this? Well, I think he's looking at himself and he's thinking, okay, I love God. Maybe making a little bit of an assumption there. He feels like he's obeyed the first part well enough. And the second part, well, that depends on who the neighbor is. So he's trying to justify himself. But he makes three mistakes, and I want to outline those for you. The first mistake that the lawyer makes, he assumes he's fulfilled the first commandment to love God with all his heart, soul, strength, mind. It's easy to be distracted in one of those areas. It's impossible for us to love as completely and totally as Jesus does. So he's assuming that he's doing that, but we know that we always have room to improve there. That's his first mistake. His second mistake is thinking he could fulfill the commandment to love God but not love people. So he's trying to get clarification on loving people so that he can justify himself. But if we truly, truly love God with everything, won't we love his creations? So that's his second mistake. I want to direct you to 1 John Chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. It's pretty simple. So that's mistake two. And then the third mistake is he wants to try to narrowly define a neighbor so that he qualifies. 
so that he can justify himself. It's easy to love those that love us. It's easy to love our friends, our, our family. Well, sometimes. But it's easy to love those that love us. It's harder to love those that hate us or that we don't even know or maybe that we don't approve of. The Jews believed that it was a duty before God to hate their neighbors. And certainly a Samaritan is, a, is an enemy. They felt it was a duty to hate their enemies. Love the neighbor, but the neighbor is their ally, the enemy they should hate. Jesus says no. So let's look at the parable that he uses to answer the lawyer's question. And we go back to Luke chapter 10, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from, Je uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, I've never been to Israel but I've read some things about the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's even today, it's not a nice place. A lot of rocks, a lot of uh, turning, just very difficult terrain. It goes from below sea level to almost 2,000 above sea level. And this area is known for robbers. So most people who traveled, traveled in a caravan. They didn't travel alone because that was inviting trouble for sure. So did this man that was traveling by himself, was he asking for it? Was he foolish? Well, maybe. Then let's read what happens next. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, you would think these two positions, a Levite, a priest, that someone could look to them for help. That surely men of, of religion would help them. But who knows the excuses these two made? You know, I've got to get on to the temple. I've got business there. Or I can't get blood on me. I'll be unclean. Or I've got to hurry home. Or... Somebody else will come by. They'll take care of him. Or he's dead anyway. There's nothing I can do. I'll pray for him. Does any of that sound familiar? We say that probably in our minds often. Then a Samaritan comes by. Now, those listening to this parable probably thought that Jesus was going to say a Jewish man came by because he has preached of the corruption of the, the religious leaders. So they're expecting that. But instead, he inserts a Samaritan someone despised and hated by Jews. Let's read what, it, what happens. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, 
brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, I think it's interesting that this is such a selfless act that this Samaritan does. Stopping to help this man could have put him in harm's way. It could have been an ambush, could have been a trick. Also, he gave of himself. He poured on wine, which with the alcohol was an antiseptic. He poured on oil, which would soothe the wound, and bandaged him up. And then he placed him on his donkey, which meant he walked. When he got to the inn, he took care of him, and then he even looked to the future by paying the innkeeper and promising to pay more if he would take care of him. Truly a selfless act. Not only did he provide the need immediately, but he looked forward and provided for in the future. So, let's see what Jesus says next to the lawyer. Which of these, this is verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Notice that the lawyer didn't say the Samaritan. He couldn't even say his nationality. That's how hated they were. So, how do we apply this parable to our own life? Obviously, Jesus is saying that Anyone in need is our neighbor, whether they are our enemy, whether they are someone that has persecuted us, whether they are different than us. He says, doesn't matter. If he has need, he is your neighbor. So how can we apply this to ourselves, to our life? How do we love people as God has loved us. Well, I think to go and do likewise, as Jesus says, there's a few things we can do. First, be a noticer. Look around. Be aware of those around you. Look at people and look for need. Perhaps you've passed someone every day who has great need, but we don't see it. We're busy with our own needs, our own cares. We're thinking about this or thinking about that. Open your eyes. Look around. Look and notice those in need around you. Often the neighbor is not the one we choose, but the one God chooses for us. Don't let the trappings of this world keep you from helping. Oh, if I, if, if I stop to help, then I'll be late for work. Somebody else will come along. Second thing you can do, prayerfully prepare for these moments. Pray for eyes that can see the needs. Pray that God will open your eyes so that you can see those that are in need. Pray to alleviate the fear you may have or the hesitation. If you have an active prayer life, 
the fear that you may have to help others will take care of itself. Pray for the person that you have come to their aid. Pray for them right then. Don't say, oh, I'll pray for you. No, do it now. Do it right then. Third thing you can do, don't hesitate. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating that you run out in harm's way. Certainly, you don't want to put your own life in danger. But, you know, don't let those little voices that say, oh, he doesn't really need help, or she doesn't really need that, or if you do that, you'll be late for work, or don't listen to those voices. Don't hesitate. If you feel convicted to help someone, Trust God that he'll make it happen. Love seizes the moment. It doesn't hesitate. It doesn't wait. Let's see if things get a little better. It acts. Reflect on your own experiences and be gracious. Keep in mind that everyone makes mistakes. Don't let a situation, maybe a person did something that put them in this situation, and you can help them. Don't take the attitude, well, they, they put themselves in this, because you have been there at one time or another. So remember God's grace to you and share that grace with others. Be thankful and let love fuel your actions. Remembering keeps you humble. And being humble helps you to reach out to others. Be generous, both with your time. We're called to be generous to the needy not only with our resources, but also with our compassion for others that are hurting. God promises that when we share what we have, no matter how little it is, he'll make it work. Don't do acts of kindness. Don't help others. Don't be the good Samaritan for recognition or reward because your reward will be here. It won't be later. Jesus is real clear on this. So the next time you see someone that has a need that you can help with, reach out to them just as God reached down to us when he sent his son. It's as simple as love God, love people. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, help us to see those around us in need. Help us to be generous and gracious not only with our compassion, but with our resources. Help us not to fear, but to reach out with love as you reached out to us. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now next week, we're going to look at another very familiar parable, the prodigal son. Have a great week, and remember, love God, love people.